This show is not even supposed to exist. It's nowhere on the calendar, or wasn't anyway. And I'll tell you how it came about. If you followed my show at all, you know that over the past several months, I've been struggling with some studio problems. I've had some audio issues online, and I've been replacing one component after another and reconfiguring and whatnot, and finally ended up replacing pretty much everything in this room. You know, the computer, uh, the mixer, and then finally last week, after having even more problems, I just replaced this one final <laughs> final piece of the pie, and it's been about a thousand bucks, and I think that's it. I think we finally wrestled the beast into submission, dialed the studio in, and I'm pretty happy with how it sounds. Well, once I got to that point, all of a sudden I get an email in from Log Talk Radio, and they say they are ready to start rolling out their HD audio option for hosts, which is really good news, something we've been waiting on for a long time. That means the people listening on iTunes and Stitcher and on Blog Talk Radio will actually get to hear high-definition audio instead of this hugely compressed feed that they have been getting in the past. In the past, you've had to go to my YouTube page to be able to hear a higher fidelity of the sound. Now you should be able to get it, starting with this broadcast, you should be able to get it on iTunes and on Blog Talk Radio. Well, I had to test it. So I went on social media and I said, hey, who's bored? You know, who's got a few minutes and could come in here and tell me whether or not you're hearing my voice and help me check the quality of the sound. And so before you know it, a few hundred people come into this chat room. And for the first 20 minutes, it's just me saying, you know, check one, two, three. Can you hear me? How's it sound? Is it distorted? How's the fidelity of the audio? Wait, I can't hear you. I can only see what you're typing in chat. Let me unplug some stuff. Let me reconfigure. Let me try this on the switchboard. Can you hear me now? No, let's keep trying. Okay, now you can't hear me. Now I, my voice has disappeared. So it was just a, a troubleshooting circus for about 20 minutes. And finally got it dialed in. And... Since we were all together, I thought, well, let's just hang out and do a show. You know, Natalie is in Arizona for the next three days. I'm bored out of my mind. I got nothing else to do. I'd rather do a podcast than go to bed early or, or just sit in front of the tube all night. So we just did an impromptu show. And for over an hour, an hour and 15 minutes or so, we just chatted about whatever. No topic, no plan, no preparation, no nothing. Just me blathering on in my sort of semi-sleepy state of mind and the callers bringing whatever they wanted to the table. And it was actually a rather pleasant evening. And rather than throw the whole thing in the trash can when it was over, I thought, well, let's just let's just put it on the radio. Let's just go ahead and keep it and air it like we would another show. If uh, this is your kind of broadcast, sit back, relax and enjoy. If you need something that's topic driven, move on. Nothing to see here. Quick note on the fidelity of the audio from Blog Talk Radio. I was listening back, and it sounds clean. It does sound like they have the HD thing dialed in. You may hear, at least I heard, a little bit of kind of a phasing in the voice. Uh, there were a couple of drops and a little bit of a phasing effect. It's not huge, but it's something I'm going to bring to the attention of the folks at Blog Talk Radio as they continue to tweak things on their end. So if you hear that, I'm aware of it. Don't worry about it. I'm all over it. I hope you enjoy the broadcast. For your approval, the impromptu show from last night, Friday night, the 14th of November 2014, a show I'm just calling Testing 1, 2, 3. Okay, here we go. Stand by. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts, losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. And let me try out a caller. Can I do that real fast? 406 on the switchboard. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. That's encouraging, because I can hear you. What's your name? Patrick. Patrick, what's going on tonight? You calling to talk about something or what? 
Well, I was asking everybody what to talk about, and I was told that I should say, hang up and call Donald Prothero. You should or I should? You should. I Actually, uh, Dr. Prothero just posted on social media that he got an autographed copy of Bill Nye's new book. And so I had to comment right away. Oh, my God, I would love to get Bill Nye on the radio. And I, I hadn't even bothered to ask. I didn't think there's any way I could get Bill Nye on my show. And Donald's like, oh, hey, I'll drop him a line. I've got his email address. <laughs> so he's going to bat for me. He's going to ping uh, Bill Nye to see if he'd be interested in coming on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. How awesome would that be? So if it happens, I will make a big noise about it, I promise. OK. Oh, that has to be an extra long show. I love the storytellers of science. You know, I just love people who take learning and make it fun and they make it fun especially for young people but but also for the rest of us and uh for that reason i've been a bill nye fan for a long long time and i'll tell him so if i ever get him on the radio i'm gonna fanboy and just be like you're amazing and i'm just such a fan of your work and thank you so i'm gonna become that guy but we'll see so i mean no promises but he's gonna ping him and see if he can squeeze me into his very busy schedule and i will let everybody know okay patrick that sounds good to me Awesome, dude. Take care of yourself. You too. Let me uh, pull up my social media pages here real fast because there's a couple of things I wanted to mention. I'm so excited we finally got this thing working. It's the little things in life. Back when I was in uh, radio, we used to play an artist from DC Talk. His name is Toby Mack. He was one of the three members of a group called DC Talk, which stood for Decent Christian Talk. And those who are a product of Christian music, especially from that era, no DC talk. And, and uh, they were, I think they were together for like 15 years, something like that. Well, Toby Max is a solo artist now, and he posted on his social media page, a uh, meme that said the phrase, do not be afraid is written in the Bible 365 times. Now I didn't vet that information. I have no idea, but I couldn't help myself. I'm like, you know, you can find a lot of happy, happy, joy, joy stuff in the Bible. It doesn't mean the Bible is a good book. So I posted on Facebook. I'm like, hey, what else is in the Bible? Knowing that this audience would just immediately jump in. Uh, Vincent said, kill is found 419 times. Destroy 419. Fear 453. Death 498. It seems to me there's a lot to be afraid of. Now, again, you're going to have to check those numbers. I'm just reading what people have brought to the table here. Somebody else said, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Which <laughs> actually a more interesting book. People are posting all sorts of uh, verses out of Leviticus and everywhere else. They're essentially pouring their rivers of blood that they found in the pages of the 66 books of the Bible on top of this thing about do not be afraid. Well, actually, God sort of promoted fear. So it's it's just one of those things. Now, I I'm certainly didn't want anybody to go troll Toby Mac on his own page. That's not the point. The point is to just sort of draw another circle around how much people miss when they are really looking for only the good and prepared to to ignore the bad. By the way, Dr. Oz made the news again this week, and I thought it was just amazing. Now, we all know Dr. Oz is like an agent of woo out there. Uh, he is one of those guys who, when I see him on television, and he's got the scrubs on, he's playing the doctor. I know he's a doctor. He's playing the doctor role, though. I mean, come on. Does he have to be in scrubs on national television on a, in a TV studio? Of course not. He's wearing scrubs because this is a role that you are playing. You're selling credibility. And the guys had all kind of crazy stuff on the air, kind of endorsing everything from homeopathy to, oh, God, you name it. He just makes me crazy. And the fact that people fawn over this man makes me crazy, just like it makes you crazy. I can see the chat room now. You're like, makes me cringe. I totally understand that. Well, Dr. Oz made a big mistake. He went on his Twitter page and he essentially said, hey, ask me any question that you like. <laughs> and just send me, just send me a question. And let me answer it. And uh, he, you know, it just came back to bite him in the ass. And of course, the humor inside some of the, the uh, reply tweets that he received are just awesome. One guy said, Oz, is it true you got into medicine because it was easier than starting your own cult? Someone else said, considering there are so many weight loss miracles, should nutrition be a religion instead of a science? 
Another physician said, why have you not been censured or fired from Columbia surgery for conduct unbecoming a physician, scientist, and gentleman? Jeez. Sarah tweeted, if I get the flu shot again, should I expect double autism or is the one from last year gone and I'll just get a new one? Chris said, I forget, do you ingest your sandalwood totem doll before or after reciting a level two diabetes warning spell? Freddie's at the bottom of the article that was posted on Salon. It's on Yahoo. It's all over the place. It said, Dear Dr. Oz, at what point today did you realize that the Twitter demographic is different from your show's regular audience? I am guessing he is regretting opening that particular can of worms, but it's beautiful to see people finally hold him accountable. The love fest that he gets from Oprah and company just makes you crazy. You just want to eat, not even just an ambush interview where you're you just come after him when he's not expecting it. Just sit down and say, look, you've made a lot of claims. You've supported a lot of this, and a lot of that. You are adding your name and sticking your name on all of these things. You are going to kind of have to back those up for us. You know, let's sit them down in front of a 60 Minutes reporter and let's just see what happens. And instead, everybody's just kissing his ass and it kind of makes me crazy. And I'm sure he's laughing all the way to the bank. So anyway, keep it up, people on Twitter, because the rest of us are hugely entertained. I have a I have a suspicion that perhaps some of the people tweeting on that thread were part of this audience. I don't know. But I mean, I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. There's an article in The Independent this week that said that the Bible was voted more valuable to humanity than Darwin's origins of species in a folio society poll. I have no idea what the folio society is. I'm guessing it's a Gallup kind of a thing, a Pew poll, that kind of deal. The article in The Independent said that the Bible has been voted more valuable to humanity than Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. By the British public, the Folio Society survey conducted by YouGov asked members of the public to name the books of most significance for the modern world. You got to be kidding me. The Bible edged just in front with 37 percent of the vote, 37 percent of people in Britain said that the Bible was the most valuable book to humanity. Uh, Darwin's book explaining his theory of natural selection was chosen by 35% of the 2044 British adults surveyed on the origin of species was chosen because it, quote, answers fundamental questions of human existence, unquote, while the Bible was cited because it, quote, contains principles and guidelines on how to be a good person. We're back to the Toby Mac thing, aren't we? We're just cherry picking away. Ignore all that other stuff. I had somebody send me a message. Uh, Was it Wednesday of this week? I guess they'd been in dialogue with someone who kept talking about the New Testament and the good stuff in the Bible. You know, let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about love thy neighbor. Let's talk about for God so loved the world. Let's talk about... For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And they're hearing a lot of this kind of stuff and having difficulty responding. And I I posted my reply and sort of shared it with everybody else in case it might help them. Here's essentially my take on it. I said, I see the examination of Scripture on three fronts. The accuracy of Scripture against the historical record, the congruity of Scripture in relation to itself, and the morality of Scripture. So you've got the historicity, the congruity. In other words, does it contradict itself? Does it it line up with itself? And the morality of Scripture. Is it a moral book? Remember that Christ said in Matthew 15, he didn't come to abolish Old Testament law, but to fulfill it, right? For I've not come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. Also, Jesus and God are the same. You read John 10, 30, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. So you got Jesus and God, same entity, same person, if you will. And God is unchanging, absolutely the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the jealous, tyrannical God of the Old Testament is the very same God that supposedly walked the shores of Galilee in the New Testament. 
Same dude. And he himself validated the rivers of blood and pain that preceded the book of Matthew. So they don't just get to walk away from the OT. They have to embrace the whole book. Of course, this also raises the question, why would God allow the propagation of a full 66-book Bible when more than half of it is obsolete and wrong for the year 2014? Also remember that as people cherry-pick the love verses about Jesus, they tend to ignore the one where Jesus instructs his followers to hate their own families on his behalf. Luke 14, 26 Quote, if anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse 34, has Jesus declaring allegiance, the ultimate popularity contest where he has to be the winner or else. Do not suppose I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword for I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And of course we're talking about a guy who continued with the divine plan that he foreknew would result in the damnation of billions and a hell that he created, rather than using his omnipotence to manifest forgiveness for the flawed children that he created, he instead decided it would be best to impregnate an unwed woman so he could father himself so that he could then be tortured and executed to rescue us from the torture that he made for us. (laughs) I mean, it's just like, it's great. People freak about the Joseph Smith story. But uh, Christianity, it's no crazier. Jesus is fun to quote mine on the church billboards, but no real examination of his story or character really holds up to scrutiny. In the end, it just comes down to the superstitious writings of anonymous authors, shaming, guilt, and fantasy. Anyway, that was kind of my take on the whole thing. So if somebody comes after you about the New Testament and about how happy and wonderful Jesus is, I had somebody, was it Neil Carter, uh, shared a post today. He was talking to somebody at their home. And uh, they were talking about the origins of Scripture and how wonderful Jesus is. And I kept waiting for the whole thing to fall back to personal experience, because that's normally what happens. Once the Bible becomes inconvenient, once church doctrine becomes inconvenient, once the, the specifics of a religion become inconvenient, then you just sort of fall back into a vague deism. Well, you know, I've had a personal experience with God, and they can call that God whatever, Jesus or whatever but it's all just personal experience or there's something out there. And that's pretty much all you get. So I thought that was interesting. Area code 478. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is Jimmy Cannon. First time caller, man. Kind of, kind of cool. Well, I'm glad you called the show. It's just kind of an impromptu evening broadcast. What's going on with you? Nothing much, man. Uh, I kind of stumbled into your podcast about three months ago and I think I've listened to everything. New member of the atheist community about a year now, doubted for about 10 years. Took me a little while. I'm 30, 38 years old. It's crazy. I work with a lot of people. I'm from Georgia, Macon, Georgia. I work with a lot of Christians that think I'm insane. Been kind of a struggle for you? Been bad, actually. I came out to my family finally about two months ago. That wasn't very good. Uh, My oldest sister. They're both very Christian. I got two sisters, family, Christian. You know, I was indoctrinated the whole nine yards, everything. I even went to the Pentecostal stage. That was odd. Um, scared the hell out of me. They promised me I could see again if I did these specific things in church, put my hands on my eyes and touch someone's shoulder and speak in tongues. It was more like a some kind of a weird hypnotism type thing. When we were in there at this camp for like four hours in this church and it just scared the hell out of me. Yeah, you know, I felt like maybe I was up there maybe 10, 15 minutes. I don't know. I felt hypnotized. So we go back. And, of course, open my eyes. I can't see. I still have bad vision. Nothing's changed. So it was very upsetting and disturbing and confusing, 15 years old. I go back to the camp where we sleep, you know, in our little bunks or whatever. All the other kids are playing volleyball, playing games, stuff. I'm in there crying because mm-hmm. I don't know what's going on. I'm freaked out. And... 
you know, the youth minister guy comes in. He's like, hey, what's going on? Why aren't you in there playing with everybody? I was like, man, I, I, you built me up in there to think I could see it again. Like, you're freaking, I don't know what's going on. I'm confused. I got questions. This is odd. This is all new to me. And he's like trying to explain it to me. And then I came home, and this is really weird. Sorry, I'm just rambling. This really happened. Okay, so I go home, and like the next three or four days, my mom and dad, I woke them up talking in freaking tongues in my sleep or something. I was asleep, I don't know, but my mom in the morning, she woke me up. She was like, hey, do you remember last night at all? I was like, no. She said, your dad tore the house apart looking for a tape recorder because you were in there just, I don't know what you were saying. You were speaking crazy language. I was like, really? So that freaked me out bad. So I quit. I quit going. I said, forget it. Pentecostal done. Out. So I come back into the other church, Baptist, doubted it for ever. And, uh, you know, next thing I know, I just started doing research in science, getting involved in things, listening to Dawkins, listening to all these other scientists and getting involved and, you know, my own, my own. And I come to the conclusion that's crazy every single bit of it. I, yeah. I just can't, I can't deal with it anymore. People kind of pity you, right? They're like, oh, you poor fella. And at the same time, you're thinking, man, I'm having a blast. I'm learning something new every day, right? Yeah, and they just don't get it. Like, uh, I hate to say it, my, my sister, I tried to get her involved, like, in the cosmos when it come on, you know? The, not the Sagan, but uh, NDT. I, I, when, when that came on, I was like, oh, I was in tears watching some of those episodes. I was like, I can, you got to watch this. This is amazing. And my sister's just like, I just don't get none of that science stuff. That don't make no sense. I'm like, oh, God, help me. Like, <laughs> no pun intended. But, like, like, really, though, like, I cannot get my family to understand the way I feel, and I can't explain it to them without them looking at me like I'm some kind of uh, I'm possessed or something sometimes. Yeah. My sister said I wasn't allowed in her house at first when I told That's her. That's crazy, right? Yeah, you don't it, agree it, with me, so up. you're not welcome inside my house. That's just tragic, man. That you was know, the people... first week, and uh, I did discuss it with her. She had me crying at work. It was a nightmare. I, I was really yeah. upset about it. Well, but, hang in there, bro. I mean, I know it's hard on families. I can be sympathetic, right? This is, to them, life and death, heaven and hell. They are desperate to see your immortal soul saved, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I mean, I hope that, uh, you know, you don't you're not allowing them to interject a lot of negativity into your into your day. I'm absolutely not. I don't let it bother me anymore. Uh, it's been a few months that I came out with them. It's cool now. Like, I mean, my mom still asked me, like, well, why do you think this? Why do you think that? And I'll give her why. And I'll I'll send her links. I'll tell her to watch things on Netflix. Like, uh, you know, Krauss and like uh, Dawkins, that whole deal, the unbelievers. I, you know, got her to watch that. Just be encouraged that you're not alone. And, you know, no atheist is out there saying we have all the answers. We just were declaring that it's okay to ask the questions. And so I hope, uh, right. hope you've got a curious life full of discovery. And I'm glad you're part of the broadcast, part of the community here. It means a lot to me, man. Thank you so much for taking my first time call. And I really appreciate everything you do, brother. All right. Take care of yourself. Have a great weekend. You got my support at the end. You too. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Right, bye. It's an amazing time to be alive. I was watching. Uh, I couldn't watch it live, but I was sort of watching the headlines around the Rosetta spacecraft that uh, launched the probe to land on the comet this week. I mean, what a freaking awesome time to be alive. We landed a probe on a comet. Is that the most cool thing? And I guess they've been able to um, turn it toward the sun a little bit more. The solar panels were not receiving enough light. They were worried about the batteries going dead. So after all this trouble, the probe would be useless, right? And I guess they've been able to turn it to receive a little more sunlight. And as I understand it, correct me in the chat room if I'm wrong. But I believe it's still receiving and transmitting information. And that is a, I mean, to, to think about uh, what we may be learning in the next few days, few weeks, few months. That's just fantastic. Just fantastic. What was the mission where they flew that um, probe into the asteroid? Able to see the impact, the explosion. And you just think, God, I mean, 
the precision to be able to do that. Somebody's doing some math. <laughs> yeah, somebody much smarter than us is doing some serious calculating. It's and to see it all happen, unbelievable. And it gives you goosebumps because you just think, you know, there was a time when people looked up at the stars and didn't even know what they were. Had no idea that there was a whole solar system and galaxy universe out there. They had no idea, no frame of reference, none. And it wasn't too long ago. I mean, in the course of human history, it wasn't that long ago that they were thinking this stuff. And um, I don't mean to get all mystical sounding about it, but, you know, we are stardust, right? We've all heard the famous Lawrence Krauss quote, and that thing just gets me every time. And it's funny because I've said that quote to a few uh, theists, and they just look at me like I'm crazy. Oh, that just doesn't sound right at all. We're stardust? And uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, actually, the the elements and stars, you can, I mean, yeah. And uh, they're, no, mm, no, mm, mm. No, we came from a dirt man and a rib woman mm -hmm, and a garden, an enchanted garden with a magic tree and a talking snake. That sounds that sounds right to me, people. <laughs> of course, that sounds reasonable. Oh, none of this star stuff business. That sounds very evolution-like, very Darwin-like. Mm -hmm. We don't do Darwin in this house. Natalie's in Phoenix. So I'm batching it for four days. I'm kind of a workaholic. So, you know, I've got this big pile of deadlines and things that need to be accomplished. And I'm just fried from it all day long. I can't do any more. And, and so I um, started watching American Horror Story on Netflix. I can only watch it in sections and pieces. It, honestly, it's compelling. It's well written. It's spooky, but it kind of brings me down. And I love a good horror movie, good horror show. But after a while, I'm like, God, I mean, the dread and the doom and the darkness is <laughs> it's just like, uh, I just, I'm depressed. I just got to walk away, you know, go play with a dog or something, come back and watch a little bit more of it. And then I just went stir crazy, you know, where nothing, it's like when you're hungry and nothing sounds good. I was like, I want to do something, but nothing sounds good, which is why, you know, we're doing this show tonight is because I was just thinking, well, what the hell? Let's just spend part of the evening together and see what happens. I've got a 918 on the switchboard. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Travis from Tulsa. Travis, what's going on, my friend? Not a whole lot. I've, uh, I don't, you, you guys talking about Twitter earlier and, uh, Somebody named Dr. Oz on Twitter. Well, I don't know if you remember a guy named Kurt Schilling. He a uh, pretty famous baseball player a long time ago. He retired from there, and he, he bankrupted a video game company he started with some really, really poor decisions. But he went on a, a pretty interesting tirade yesterday and uh, about denying evolution and uh, fossil records. And he, he put up a video that was it was somewhere along the lines of some stuff that your, your favorite uh, – backwards hat pastor would would produce and uh, I, I didn't know if you'd even seen that or it even had even known it was there but it, it's it's pretty bad i saw some blowback from it uh from some people i guess on twitter and out there in different news sites but yeah something like um all creatures coming from one cell that's crap uh how did fossils become humans um, right right yeah it's alarmingly scary ignorance of basic evolution for sure. And, and unfortunately people latch onto that because he is a type of celebrity or he must know what he's talking about. He was, you know, he's famous. We got to go with what he said. And I, I don't even know who produced the video that, that he used as part of his evidence. The evolution, a modern, a tale of modern myth. It, it's pretty bad. I, I, I don't understand but how people actually believe believe something i mean we you talk about it every week the the stuff that people believe and you it's more believable that we came from talking animals and ribs and everything else than science stuff i pulled up the uh yahoo sports article on kurt schilling while you were speaking and i saw one of his tweets said something like this country got word it's because 
this country got where it is because people are scared to stand up for what they believe in. Does anyone within the sound of my voice think people are scared to say what they're really thinking? And the, especially in the age of social media, is are people sitting on their hands terrified to be able to say what they want? Hell, even the people I know in the atheist community are so desperate to have their voices heard that if they're afraid of personal and professional consequences, they'll make a dummy account and they'll use that to go stand up for what they believe. <laughs> Even, you know, so the idea that, uh, you know, we're all a, a fear nation is just a straw man. It's absolute crap. And I think that with like you're, you're talking about social media, even if they're just doing, you know, a, a pseudonym or something, I think that gives people a little bit more, a little bit more power to say what they want. It was I, I listen to people that call on your show every week and it's it's unfortunate to me. But I mean, you you understand Tulsa specifically where how you were right. I mean, you can't, you can't drive a block without running into a church. And I was very fortunate. I was raised to make my own decisions. Um, both of my parents were really raised either you know, Christian or Baptist or, or, or something similar. And, uh, both my sister and I turned out atheists. I, I rode the fence for a long time. And then on a, uh, on a trip to the middle East, um, somebody gave me the God delusion. And I think I read it probably in three days. It was a little, a little overwhelming at first because, you know, you know how he writes. He's very in your face, but that pretty much sealed it for me. And I was real surprised. I, I don't know how much you, you follow the local stuff, but there is a the atheist community of Tulsa. And uh, okay. I was really very surprised that my father actually wanted to go, like, hang out with us one night. And I think he's, I think he, even after all these years, I think he, he doubts what he was taught to believe being raised. You know, they're like, uh, as of last year, 600 strong, I think, in that group in Tulsa, which is great. You know, it's just uh, they've done a lot of great things over there. And and um, I'm excited. You know, it's in some ways, Oklahoma really frustrates me and I'm ready for a change. And in some ways, I think, well, I'd rather be a skeptic here than in a place where nobody gives a shit. You know, so I go back and right, forth. Right, yeah. So absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for calling the broadcast and uh, being a part of it. Thanks for listening and all my best. All right. I think so. Take it easy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I hope people aren't getting their science from Kurt Schilling. Just like people getting their science from pastors. Just don't. And don't get your science from someone who says they defer to the Bible first and then they do science. Like the PhDs who are forced to sign these agreements on. Uh, Answers in Genesis and the Creation Institute, right? They have all these quote unquote scientists, but R. and Rod did a great expose, and some other people I think have done exposes that they have to go in and they have to make a declaration before they can be on a board or panel or what have you that they won't accept any quote unquote science that disagrees with the words of Scripture. Well, that's not true science, right? You're starting with the answer and then asking the questions, and you are ready to reject evidence because you are going to pre-accept the words of uh, the Holy Bible. And uh, so I just, they're not, I didn't even consider them scientists, not really. I, I not Certainly not reliable ones. If you start by saying, well, I refuse to accept anything that does this, are you a, are you a scientist? I mean, are you genuinely doing science? I just don't think so. And uh, so I'm sort of quick to discount those folks. I'm working on a project I hope it comes to fruition. You know, I I struggle sometimes, especially when things are busy, with, you know, looking at a computer monitor and not really knowing what comes next. Do you ever feel that way? Creative people, I know sometimes they, whether they write or they write music or they paint or do something else, they hit points where they just think, I have no idea what to do next. I have no inspiration. It's not that you're not passionate about what you do. It's not that you don't know that, you know, what you are about, but do I have anything to say today? Is there anything that resonates with me? Is there anything that would resonate with the audience? Is there anything that won't bore people to tears? Uh, they've heard my story. They've heard my take on the Old Testament. They've heard my take on the New Testament. We've done shows on politics. We've done shows on cults and fringe religions. We've done shows about this, about that, about mental health, about uh, you know everything from the Church of Satan to depression to you name it. Is there anything left to say? And I found myself sort of in that spot where I think, oh, you know, geez, I, my worst nightmare is this show becoming blasé, just something that uh, we've already been there, done 
that and there's no reason to tune in. I feel a tremendous sense of responsibility to try to produce weekly shows that people will benefit from and be entertained by and want to listen to. And I don't want to screw it up. (laughs) I want it to be good, you know. Sometimes I find myself just, I just look at the screen and I just think, I got nothing. I go through this a couple times a year. I got nothing. No idea. You know, you're starting to type a paragraph. You're starting to write a script. You're starting to write a chapter for a book. You're starting to produce a video. You're prepping a podcast. You're even starting a social media post. I have no idea how to finish this sentence. I can't figure it out. I feel like I'm in this sort of creative desert. You ever feel that way? Well, I'm sort of, I've had that struggle for the past couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden I'll catch up. Uh, Working on this book. I went through a time when I was just cranking. You know, Deconverted was the same way. I was cranking just page after page, and it was coming out the way I wanted. I was saying what I wanted to say the way I wanted to say it. I'm in the zone. It's driving everybody crazy. Honey, I'll be a little late. I can't. You guys, go ahead and have dinner without me. I'm afraid to stop. I'm afraid to stop because I'm afraid that this will leave me. And so you go, 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 go. And then you go to sleep and you wake up the next morning, you have your coffee, you come in and you look at the same set of paragraphs and you have no idea what to type next. None. You have no idea what to produce next. What show to schedule next. You just don't have any water in the well or you don't know how to draw it. And that's been kind of a challenge lately. What, you know, ah, what are we, what, what do we do? How do we, what do people want to do? What do they want to talk about? What does this show need to be for the year 2015? And I'm producing a project for Atheist TV that is about Christmas. Now, I've done a project for Christmas a few years back that I bring out every December. It's called To Xmas and Beyond that talks about Xmas in relation to Christmas and whatnot. And uh, the pagan origins of so many Christmas traditions and how many atheists actually do celebrate the Christmas holiday. This is surprising to a lot of people. You know, oh, yeah, Merry Christmas. I say those words and I've had people say, well, that just makes no sense coming from you. You know, I don't celebrate the religion of Christmas. I celebrate the tradition of Christmas. And we always go back to, you know, I wish people a happy Thursday. It doesn't mean I believe in Thor, which is who Thursday is named after, right? It's Thor's day. I tell people I hope they have a great month of March. March is named after the god Mars. Do I believe in Mars? Do I worship Mars? Do I have to worship Mars to be able to enjoy the entire month of March? I think not. Most of what we do during Christmas The fun stuff, the stuff that means the most to us, is it really the church service and dragging our asses through those live nativities where they bring the animals out? (laughs) You should see the live nativities. They've done plenty here in my town, right? They've got camel. They'll actually have it on the marquee. Live camels, that kind of thing. Live donkeys. And they have uh, all these actors out. And people get in their cars and they drive through these drive through nativity scenes. I think they start with maybe a revelation, right? The revelation to Mary or Joseph. And then the other uh, traveling to Bethlehem and then the manger and the wise men and all that shit. And um, do people really get that much out of, you know, oh, let do people think I can't wait to drive through a nativity? Or I can't wait to go to a, to a, a Christmas Eve candlelight service or something. No, the stuff that means the most to them on Christmas is the stuff that has nothing really to do with their religion. In most cases, in my opinion, right? It's hanging out with the people they care the most about. And, you know, go out and buy some gifts for people you love and decorate the house, put the tree up, have the music, a little Bing Crosby in the background, hot cider, pumpkin pie. Man, that's the good stuff. And these are the things that bring, I think, the biggest smile to people's faces when it comes to the holiday, right? It's not going in to have some pastor pound them over the head with the nativity story and the salvation message or to go sit through another church or Christian school Christmas pageant, you know, until us a child is born. I mean, come on. 
No, the good stuff is sitting out in the snow, you know, sitting out in the back porch with the snowflakes coming down. You got your mittens on, you know, and then you go warm up. You get to go outside and play in the snow and you get real chilled. And then you go inside and you warm up in front of the fireplace with some hot chocolate and the people you care about. Jeez, that's what I'm talking about. Stockings over the fireplace. We're going to make a stocking for Henry this year, a little rescue dog. We've got a stocking for everybody else in the family. He's the newest addition. It's our first Christmas with him. And even though he's a dog, damn it, he's getting a stocking. We're going to have a ball making that thing. That's the good stuff. And uh, I really do contend that uh, even religious people, the stuff that means the most to them about Christmas, has nothing to do with Christ. It has nothing to do with uh, the church stuff that they're pitching. It's nothing to do with all that shit they're talking about on Fox News. You know, it's just not. Gives people a reason to pull a Kurt Schilling and talk about how they're under attack because they're afraid. Well, that's just bogus. Nobody's afraid. Then they get to come out and talk about how atheists are all, they, we hate nativity scenes. We hate nativity scenes. We want all nativity scenes to be sort of rounded up and taken to a big pile and burned. Well, that's not true either. I will fight for your right to have a nativity scene on your private property as a reflection of your private Faith, we just personally don't want our government that's supposed to represent all people pushing religious symbols for a specific religion, right? It's not a Christian government. It's a government that represents all of us. So whenever you see a nativity or a Ten Commandments statue or something on a courthouse lawn or a government lawn or something, we just go, hey, wait a minute. This is not what the founding fathers intended. We're not raising our voices. We're not freaking out. And all of a sudden, everybody else paints us as being the devil. They hate Christmas. They're trying to destroy Jesus. No. You know, if you want to put up a nativity set, knock yourself out. Put up one of those cheese ball lighted ones. I've seen some huge nativity sets. Life size plastic nativity sets. Fully lit with real hay and fabric. And we already mentioned the ones that uh, churches do, the drive through ones with genuine animals in them. You know, knock yourself out. Nobody's saying you can't have a nativity set. Nobody's saying you can't put a big Jesus thing in. Can't put a cross in your front lawn. And go ahead. I'm not saying it looks good or it's in great taste, but you have every right to own and express your personal religious view. You just don't get to have government pitching you and your deity over somebody else. My tax dollars aren't going to go to pitch Jesus. It's just not working that way. And that does not make me the devil. It makes me mildly observant. Anyway, my original point with that Atheist TV on Roku is doing some uh, videos for Christmas. And they've asked people like me to submit on our own take on the Christmas holiday. Well, I thought about it and I can't tell if it's a mistake or not, but I agreed. <laughs> I just said, Oh, well, all right, fine. I'll come up with it. So I've got until December the 1st to get this thing together. 15 minute production, something like that. Now, you know, what's funny is I'm looking at my computer monitor. I'm going, what? Like, I know what I want to say. I just not sure. I know how I want to say it. And I, now I'm on the hook, right? Now I've got another deadline to meet. It was just too good an opportunity to pass up to be part of that message out there. Do I think theists are watching Atheist TV? Well, it's possible. Out of curiosity, I think there might be a lot of people on the fence, though, who are watching. Fundamentalists, now nah, they discounted us long ago. But it's the people who are having that ringing alarm bell of doubt in the back of their skulls, the people who are struggling with the voices of doubt in the back of their mind who are starting to think to themselves, you know, there may be some real problems here. I'm going to check this thing out just out of curiosity. You know, that's when things start to happen. And I'd love it if somebody who had no idea that the United States was not founded as a Christian nation, got into some of that information and found out that you know, God wasn't even on the money on coins until the 1800s, late 1800s, wasn't on paper money till the 50s, 1950s, wasn't under God, not on the original pledge. All right. 
um, to understand that uh, actually uh, December 25th has a lot more to do with the winter solstice than it ever did. Certainly not Jesus's birthday. And you get to talk about Mithra and Balder and Ra and the sun gods and and the the pagan uh, origins of uh, using evergreen trees, which is where we get the Christmas tree, all that stuff. I'm hoping somebody will just kind of scoot along there. So I'm motivated to try to get something in there. I'm just not sure exactly how I'm going to do it. And I'm starting to panic. <laughs> uh, you know, I just hope it doesn't suck, people. Hope it doesn't suck. I'm a, it's funny, I, you know, I've said this a few times. I used to be a video producer who occasionally did podcasts. And now I'm a podcaster who occasionally does videos. And I wish I could have myself cloned because I'd like to be able to do both. You know, just, I mean, I love shooting and producing video. I love radio. Um, I love writing. I love all those types of things. I just find myself unable to, to really handle it all. And, um, my love for radio, I guess, is I guess it's made the podcast a priority for me. It's it's such an intimate medium, you know. It's just you and me, right? It's just uh, us talking. It's not like I'm in the production room for three weeks to produce a four minute animated piece. Uh, it's not like I'm you know having to go and travel somewhere and bring camera and lights and shoot interviews and bring them back and edit them put together for a six or seven minute piece every week you and i get to hang out for between 60 and 120 minutes and have real conversation and that's attractive to me i, I don't know how you feel about it but it's it's uh i mean if i i wouldn't want to choose it's like choosing your children if you had to pick one well i don't think i could but if i had to it'd be the podcast somebody in the um Somebody in the chat room asked what the model of camera that I use. Well, it's funny. Uh, just a few months ago, a couple months ago, I picked up. I needed a portable rig, right? Something I can get on a plane, something I can carry around easily. And technology has really, really shrunk the camera. It's funny. Uh, Ten years ago, you'd spend you know, 20, 25 grand for a broadcast quality camera. Well, maybe not that much if you got into the Sony um maybe the Z1 series and whatnot. Those are, uh, I forgot how much those were new five, $6,000. Now people are shooting 1080p high def video on their cell phones. Right. And I, um, I've loved watching the cost of gear come down and I picked up a little Canon XA 20 and, um, it is awesome. I mean, it's, you know, you can fit the thing in a shoe box and uh, it shoots super clean. I've shot several speeches with it, shot several interviews with it. I can fit it under the seat of an airplane. It's got steady shot. It's got a cinema mode on it. It's got a, a slight high speed uh, mode on it. A lot of color options. It's got the ability to record like 12 hours on SD cards and just poured it right in and edited. It is probably one of the best little cameras for the money. I think I paid two grand for that sucker, two thousand dollars, and it shoots better than rig that uh, you know I've seen. Uh, we paid one at the, the office uh, production company I worked for. Last camera they bought was close to seven thousand bucks. Doesn't shoot anywhere near the XA twenty does. So it's just funny. And, and now that four K starting, then sorry, went off on a tangent. Now that four K is starting to to uh, become a thing. I think 4K is going to be what uh, widescreen televisions were. I think it's going to take longer to roll it out than people are estimating, but it's inevitable. I think uh, we're, you know, we're looking at some very, 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 very high definition coming in the next five years. And uh, I'll be curious to see how long it takes for everybody to switch over and, uh, and make that. But I mean, the resolution is amazing. You know, once you get to essential, essentially uh, crystal clarity, you know, real life clarity. Now, what do you do? And the thing about technology is you just have no idea what they're going to come up with next. You have no idea how they're going to enhance the experience for the viewer. There is probably an invention that none of us have thought of. And in 10 years, it will be all the rage. I love technology. I think Michael Crichton had written a book called Timeline. And in the beginning of the book, it's like the introduction of the first chapter, he talked about how technology is so often 
unexpected. You know, you'll have futurists who can't predict much about what will be done. I remember when I saw the making of the film Minority Report by Steven Spielberg with Tom Cruise in the title role, they actually had futurists come in to help design what the future might look like, the future of transportation, uh, you know, your home amenities, that type of thing, technology in general. And they got a lot of it right. I mean, we're starting to see some of that stuff really happen, you know, the self-driving car. and and uh, But there's much about technology that we just will never see coming. We, we have no clue. You just, you thought, God, who thinks that stuff up? I didn't realize that was possible. That's the stuff that blows my mind. And that that's exciting. Speaking of technology, since I'm on a bunny trail, I'm on a tangent. Uh, I read an article today that Google Glass, I guess they're starting to really sweat <laughs> over, over that. Uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about Google Glass uh, I've taken some heat because I'm not a big fan. I mean, look, I don't want to be standing at the men's urinal. Somebody walks in with a video camera on their face. I just don't want it. And I don't think I'm being my own grandfather when I say that there comes a time and there comes circumstances when you need to just be a human being. Take the freaking glasses off your face. I don't want photographs. I don't want you to be videoing while we're talking. I don't need you browsing the web with your left eyeball or whatever. Let's just talk like real people. And uh, the apps and everything, the whole thing, the rollout, everything's taken so long that I guess the air is leaving the balloon. And while Google is saying, oh, now we're fully behind it, we've just pushed it to 2015 to make sure that the timing for the release is right. I guess you can already buy them online, the Explorer versions of them that were originally going for 1500 bucks. They're now like half that on eBay. The app developers are all pissed off because you can't find enough uh, material, can't find enough apps, you can't find the support. They just think this thing may be dead before it starts. And who really knows? I might be totally wrong. But, you know, if, if people aren't walking around with Google Glass on their face in two years, you're not going to break my heart. I love technology. I mean, I'm married to my smartphone. Uh, I love digital editing. I love most of what technology brings us. But from time to time, I look at something and go, oh, God, you know, let's just be human beings, man. I want to see your eyes. I don't want to see the camera in front of your eyes. <laughs> And, you know, I'm not I'm not sure I want to I'll call them glass holes, but I'm close. And I don't that does that make me a bad person? You guys in the chat room, look, if somebody said, I'm going to I'll give you Google Glass and you can just use it for your everyday life, use it for work, use it for play, use it for whatever. Would you do it? Would you wear them? I guess the people who wear them take a lot of shit when they're out there walking the streets. People are saying stuff to them, telling them about how they ridiculous they look. I mean, it's just been it's, it has not been this parade of amazement. <laughs> you know, uh, It's like the first time you saw somebody with one of those uh, Bluetooth ear pieces for their cell phone. You thought that looks ridiculous, right? And then within six months, it was normal. It's like, oh, hey, he's got a Bluetooth. You don't even see them. And I wondered if Google Glass would be like that. Before long, they'd be so ubiquitous, you wouldn't even see them. I don't know if that's the case or not. But I'm, I find them, as technology goes, I find them very self-conscious. They, they just scream out, I'm looking at you and potentially recording you. That's what those glasses do for me. So uh, I, I don't know what to, uh, I started talking about cameras, got on the technology. Now we're talking about Google. What's happened to my brain? Let me uh, see if I can relocate the switchboard. Oh, looky, there it is. And we'll go back to area code three, one, zero. You're on the thinking atheist radio podcast. Who's this? I put them to sleep. Three, one, zero. Who's this? Hi, this is Connie. Sorry, I was on mute. Connie, it's my fault. I was, you know, off in Gumby land, you know, it's <laughs> late and I'm kind of fried. And so what's going on with you? 
Well, first I wanted to um, thank you for your book, uh, Deconverted, actually helped me a lot. Um, I started doubting at a very young age uh, when I was like, when, when I was a kid, my mom used to send us to church camp because it was free and she got us out of the house for two weeks over the summer. Um, and I was talking to a counselor and I said, well, you seem to know everything. Why are we here? And she said to worship God. And I said, well, that seems like kind of a you know, conceited thing to do to put us here just to worship him. And she said, well, that would be if there was anyone else but God. And so that was kind of like the little seed. And um, then when I was in uh, college, I majored in astrophysics and kind of, you know, saw all the things that you were supposed to need religion for kind of fall by the wayside as they were explained by science. Um, but it was just this this struggle to let go of the, you know, I'm going to burn in hell, the fear. And um, actually, so reading your book really helped me kind of let go of that and be able to call myself an atheist out loud. Um, and yeah, thank you. Um, and then the thing that I actually wanted to, I wanted to suggest a show topic. So I'm in recovery, uh, in early recovery. I'm an alcoholic. And so I went through this, you know, kind of soul searching process, if you will, to find out that I'm an atheist, that I don't believe in God. And then I show up to an AA meeting and they're like, guess what? You have to believe in God. And I'm like, you got to be shitting me. <laughs> and so I, I was kind of hoping that maybe you could do an episode on really how to deal with recovery as an atheist, because it's very difficult. There are a few of us that don't necessarily believe in God, but you still have to believe that there's a higher power that can meddle in your everyday life. And, you know, I through a very, you know, long, thoughtful process, decided that I don't believe that that exists. Um, I'm pulling it up here to make sure I get the title right. I honestly think this is a topic we should cover again. But we did do a show in the past. I believe we called it Recovering. or No, it's called Overcoming Without Religion. Is that right? Hang on just a second, Connie. Overcoming... We've done so many. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to have to go look it up. And what I'll do is uh, if you'll shoot me an email, Seth at the thinking atheist.com, I will send you a link to that show. We did a whole broadcast on people who, you know, how do I overcome without having to go to Wooville <laughs> or listen to, you know, preaching from, tell me about AA, if you would. I've heard many people say that it was uh, one guy said that they were, almost non-discriminate, just pick some point of focus other than yourself and use it, rely on it to get through. Is that an overstatement or is that what they do? It, it depends on the group that you go to. Um, the area that I'm in seems to be that your higher power can be anything you want, but we all know the Christian God is the right answer. Um, you know, we say the Lord's Prayer at the end of every meeting. And my first sponsor, actually, it turns out was a former nun and uh, was, uh, you know, she just didn't understand that I didn't believe. And so she said, well, why don't you borrow my God? And I'm like, but I don't believe in your God either. Um, and so it's uh, it, it's it's a bit tough because when you go, to, you know, uh, I've been really thinking about this the past, um, I'm very new in recovery, um, so I've been thinking about this the past few months that I've been going to meetings and kind of listening, and it all turns into God. Well, you know, God put this in my life, and God took this from my life, and God gave me the opportunity to do this, and I'm just kind of sitting there going, oh my God, like, you know, like, you worked for this, or, you know, shit happened, and they just can't accept that. I discovered that they just had their first conference, uh, international conference of atheists and agnostic people in AA. Um, so it's, I, it looks like it's starting to be a movement that's springing up. So hopefully they'll define some meetings of people like that. But. You know, I've heard, and I don't want to be irresponsible and um, say that this is fact. So I would encourage those uh, to to follow up and maybe correct the record if I've gotten it wrong. But as I understand it, you know, AA's success rate is not necessarily any greater than some other success rates or people who try to quit on their own. I mean, I think everyone has to find the solution that's right for them. And if AA helps, knock yourself out. You know, do what works for you. Has it helped you in some way? 
has in that there's this built-in support network. But I do feel kind of a discrimination because people look at you sideways if you don't fully buy in there. The preamble that they say at every meeting says that, you know, if you can't give yourself to this simple program as written, basically that there's something wrong with you. Um, wow. And you kind of feel uh, a bit a bit like an outsider. Well, do you feel like it's sort of the only game in town? So it's AA or nothing? Unfortunately, yeah. Um, I don't know of a whole lot. You know, I did go to a rehab and almost all rehabs are based on 12-step programs. And it just seems like that's kind of the best that we can do at this point, which I don't really yeah. understand how we can't do any better. You know, it's a medical problem. It's a problem with your body. It's not with your mind, which is actually the big book says that it's a problem in your mind, but. Well, there's uh, organizations like secular organizations for sobriety. They're called SOS mm -hmm. and a few others that are out there. So, I mean, if you're, if you're looking, uh, I don't know much about them, but uh, you know, you might Google search them and, and uh, see what's out there. Maybe there'll be some options for you. I wish you the best. If there's anything we can do for you, just, you know, you have your people call our people, Connie. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank awesome. You so much. Take care of yourself and thanks for calling tonight. It means a lot. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. See you later. You know, I'm, an, I'm not going to knock anybody who goes to AA if they find benefit there. I think uh, it sounds to me like AA is a lot like what church is, you know. People go to church and they are surrounded by people who love them and miss them and support them. They have a communal experience together. They lift each other up in the down times. They, they make friends. They make family in many cases. They unite for a common purpose. There are programs like divorce uh, help and, and addiction help and all these other things or stuff for the kids. You know, it, it sort of scratches the human itch in a lot of ways. It uh, certainly scratches the relational itch. And then uh, all of the other stuff is, um, you know, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, you can take it or leave it. I mean, you can come together and hear a, a sermon and whatnot. But mostly I think it's about going, enjoying music together and making friends and, and being cared about by other people. And I think that gets us back to, uh, you know, it's like Christmas. It's like the best things about church aren't necessarily the religious things. Best things about church are really the human things. You know, it's the tradition. Tradition can be a healthy and helpful thing, being able to be there for one another. And I wonder if AA is kind of like that. And uh, yeah, they paint everything with a God brush, but the structure itself is just people, you know, otherwise God would be your accountability partner, wouldn't it? God would be uh, your sponsor. You wouldn't need a human being. God, the creator of the universe, ought to be the best sponsor imaginable. Instead, they've got you eye to eye with another human being. I think that's pretty. Uh, I think that's pretty revealing about AA. Uh, we may have to do another show about recovery from addiction or dealing with addiction in the secular context here in, in uh, the first quarter. You know, I, I hesitated repeating topics because people on the Internet can go back and I have this fear again of being too redundant. But with all the new people listening and I just think some discussions are worth having a lot more than one time. You know, we can talk about things more than just one show uh, with so many vast experiences out there, vast perspectives out there. There's a lot that we can do. So why not? Maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll schedule that for January or February. Speaking of January, I'm coming up on the 200th show of the thinking atheist radio podcast, 200 shows almost in the can it's hard to believe that's a lot of time behind the microphone a lot of time listening <laughs> thank you for being with me this long i'm working on some options to do the uh, 200 episode live for the live studio audience in a major city i don't have any details yet i'm still floating some trial balloons to make it happen but uh, i'd really love to get a bunch of people together and a live studio audience and bring in some atheist activists that you know and just make it a party on air. 200 shows. It's hard to believe it. Anyway, that's going to be, I believe that should fall in mid-January unless something happens. So keep your eyes open because uh, it should be big. 314, thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? 
Greetings, Seth. It's Phil Godfrey in St. Louis. How are you doing this evening? Oh, uh, wow. You sound like a fellow broadcaster. You've got that. Uh, well, you know, surprisingly, we met last year when you when you did your uh, your podcast out of St. Louis at the uh, Shafley uh, Brew House. Yeah, at the brewery. That's right. Yes, that was, uh, I think you ordered a fat tire, if I wasn't mistaken. Um, I think I had two. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. I, I, are, are we really kind of going on a theme here, or is this just kind of talk about, because I had asked you about the uh, camera equipment earlier. I don't have a theme tonight at all. I'm uh, Tonight's just kind of a random. I, I, honestly, this show began as I asked the people in the chat room to help me calibrate the gear as a blog talk radio sort of changed their dial in protocols for hosts. So yeah. we did a bonus podcast. There are no rules. So what do you want to talk about? Well, um, I think I've seen it in the chat rooms a couple of times. I've seen the uh, comments on Facebook, uh, the YouTube comments as well on uh, your uh, podcast that you post. What kind of equipment do you use for processing your audio? Um, and have you ever thought about putting uh, just a camera up to kind of film as you go along as you do the podcast so we can or or is there more going on behind the scenes that you just don't want us to see well i mean you know i i've you know it's funny i have thought about doing a simultaneous video feed with the audio i just don't know how much it really brings radio is such an intimate medium you know you're you're allowing the listener to sort of paint their own mental picture and Mm. so the, and there's a well, magic. We already know you're handsome. I mean, we already know what, what you look like. You're a handsome guy, so we could, you know, <laughs> we can I mean, see I, that. You know, the the idea for me is I might do the occasional one with video, but if I do it, it might be a bonus thing that I provide to the uh, people who are supporting the show on the Patreon mm-hmm. channel. I just started the Patreon thing a few months ago for people who mm-hmm. want to try to support the show. and And I don't you know, you are able, you're supposed to give rewards to people who are, or you have the option of giving rewards to people who are donating or becoming patrons. And I'm like, Jesus, uh, when am I supposed to find time to, to do more? Uh, I, I just, okay. I can't, but I thought, well, you know, one thing we might be able to do is the occasional audio video tandem kind of podcast where you get a mm-hmm. behind the scenes look into the studio, but don't people really want to sort of create their own mental pictures? Do they really need to see me looking into a webcam blathering on? Wouldn't they rather just close their eyes, listen and go get on with mm-hmm. their life? What are you guys in the chat room think? Would you rather have video or just audio? Give me some, I mean, what do you think people would want a video feed for this thing? Well, I, you know, I, I mean, the, the 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 members in the chat room can can answer that. I mean, I certainly don't speak for you know anyone but myself, but um, yeah. it's um, I think it'd be kind of fun occasionally. Uh, uh, you know, maybe as a novelty, I'm I might, and and only if we could make it visually interesting somehow. Just I, it, would somebody want to just look at me flapping my gums when they could listen just as easily. You know, I don't know. <laughs> to answer your equipment question, we'll, I set we'll this see thing your, up. We'll see your eye rolls. We'll see your eye rolls when uh, when certain callers call. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it probably will. Uh, as far as the gear is concerned, I set this studio up like a uh, essentially like a broadcast studio. I've got a, a Symmetrix 52080 voice processor, which is kind of the industry standard. And uh, Shure SM7B microphone. I've got the end of the big boom mic stand that comes in and studio monitor speakers and whatnot. Honestly, you know, 10, 15 years ago to put a broadcast studio together, you're looking at oh, cost a five, 100 grand, yeah. right? And now you can yeah, do it yeah. for a few thousand computer and broadcast mic. And if you want to soup it up a little bit with some broadcast tools and toys, you can. But I use just kind of a basic setup. It's nothing fancy. Right. Jeff, thanks Here for taking the call. Have a great weekend. All right. See you later. All right. Stay warm. St. Louis was a great stop. We had an absolute ball. And uh, I'm already trying to get my head around, uh, you know, putting a tour together for the first part of 2015. Uh, Normally, that is something that I do with the local groups in a city. You know, let's say they decide they like to have an event and um, they want to host an evening. And I'll bring out a presentation, material that's not on YouTube. It's fresh material. 
and we'll make an evening of it. You know, I'll do a full blown presentation. We'll hang out, do some Q and a, sometimes we'll go out to eat afterwards. Mostly it's just a chance to hang out and be together. And what uh, I get out of it is the chance to get out of my little hidey hole here and have some human contact, you know, which is something I crave. And what they get out of it is they get a chance to, uh, to have an event. And I, of course, promote the local groups on all the promotional materials and talk about it online, my website on the podcast. So they get some hits and attract some people who haven't been there before. And so if you are, you know, you're a city who wants to be on the tour, I guess it's going to be a book tour, I guess, with the book coming out, I think in February or March, I'm not even sure what the content of the speech will be, but it'll be fun. It's always a good time. If you know a local group that wants to set that up, you know, geez, I did 30 cities this last year, 33, not including the major conventions. We did uh, six cities in one weekend in North Carolina. That one about killed me, actually. That one just about killed me. I had the best time. But when I got home, I was so tired. And within 48 hours, I was as sick as a dog. And I got Natalie looking at me going, well, this is what happens when you push yourself too hard. Six cities in three days. What did you expect was going to happen? Now sit down and take your medicine. (laughs) Yes, nurse Natalie. But I'm looking, uh, kind of looking ahead to 2015. We'll we'll set some uh, some stuff up. Also, it's if you're part of a coalition of uh, several groups in one state, that's also optimal. You know, if I'm going to go to North Carolina, I mean, let's try to do as many cities in that one trip on one plane ticket as possible. I'm going to go to you know, St. Louis or go to Missouri. Well, let's do St. Louis. Let's do Branson. Let's do. Uh, cities you know drivable cities in the area we can actually sort of tie them all in together and it ends up being a kind of circuit and it really is fun if you've never been to one trust me and this isn't just shameless self-promotion the events are largely free it's very rare i think if we charge admission it's usually only because we have to pay for the venue Uh, i want everybody to feel like they're welcome to come out and we just connect we laugh and we we hug and we swap stories and we Sometimes they have to kick us out because, you know, it's a weeknight or the place is closed. Everybody take it, your shit and go. (laughs) That's very, very common. That's the kind of evening we have because we're a family. I certainly hope you feel that way. So when those happen, there is an events page at thethinkingatheist.com. And you can uh, monitor those. And if you're interested in putting something together, just drop me an email, Seth at the thinking atheist.com. I see the clock on my show beginning to crawl to a close. Thank you so much for being a part of this impromptu broadcast. Part of the reason, again, that we're doing the broadcast is to sort of check the new equipment to make sure it sounds right, it's working right. And uh, it sounds like we may have actually beaten the beast into submission and you were a big part of that so thanks so much for helping me out it means a whole lot hope your evening is wonderful hope your weekend is wonderful i will catch you on tuesday of next week as we talk about the quiverful movement quiverful meaning you have a crap ton of kids because jesus told you to do it and this is hard on the kids it's hard on mom it's hard on everybody it sounds like but dad we're going to talk about it quiverful next tuesday the thinking atheist radio podcast good follow the thinking atheist on facebook and twitter watch dozens of original videos on the thinking atheist youtube channel and visit our website for resources links contact information the editor's blog and more thethinkingatheist.com